And hi, everyone. I am Carolyn Patches, Resource Developer and Marketing Associate for the YWCA. I want to be facilitating the questions and answers part of this series. We thank you for being a part of this community conversation. Just a few details of today's format. It will be a presentation and there will be opportunities for you to ask questions throughout the chat box. You can use the questions and answers session. Be mindful that some of your questions might be answered through the presentation. We would ask you to keep open mind and respect each other's thoughts and opinions. We hope that everyone can gain some important knowledge. I present to you our YWCA Executive Director, Guillaume Stewart. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you for that wonderful uh, introduction. Um, I'm super excited about this presentation. Um, as Carolyn said, I think it's gonna be an opportunity for us to grow as a community and to really learn uh, more about social justice um, and about diversity and inclusion. I wanna give a shout out to the committees that have been working on these presentations. I know firsthand that they've been working super hard uh, to bring these series to you guys and to the community. And I, I'm really proud of the work that they're doing. Um, I also wanna just shout out the YWCA Bucks County, um, the organization I feel honored to be a part of. Uh, they've been doing great work in the community long before we became uh, members of this great organization, way back in 1954. And now uh, in 2020, we're members and we're doing really great work. And I'm excited to be a member of this organization. I'm excited to carry out its mission. I'm excited to build community uh, through the work that we do. Uh, we have some really great presenters that's gonna be here tonight speaking to you. They've worked really hard. My conversations with them over the last few weeks have been really great. I think these are two outstanding people that care about the community. I think they really wanna help us learn and grow um, so I hope you guys enjoy the presentation, uh, learn a lot from it. It's going to be fun. We're going to have good questions. We're going to learn and grow together. So I'm excited about that. So without further ado, I'm happy to present to you Sarita and Ilya, and, and I'll pass the ball to you guys. All right, thank you very much. Um, so just a quick introduction of myself. My name is Ilya Moses. I am an operations manager at one of the historic sites in Philadelphia. And I'm also involved in um, piloting a diversion and inclus um, inclusion um, program for my company. A um, little a bit of my background, um, I was born in uh, Monrovia, Liberia, which is in West Africa, for some of you who may or may not know, it was founded by free American slaves. Uh, my mother is Russian and my father is from Sierra Leone, which is also in Africa. And basically why I'm doing this is uh, I want to create a world that I've, I've grown up in for everyone. Uh, when my children, I have three beautiful children that are the apple of my eye. Um, and the picture you see on this slide is the world that I live in, and I've grown up in. Um, in this picture, you see people all walks of life, demographic, um, everything. And I want my children and your children to have that same future, live that same uh, culture and that same world. Um, they, when they grow up, are going to have their own battles to fight. Um, the least we can do as the adults um, piloting the ship right now is to do our best to tackle the problem here and now so we don't have to deal with it in the same manner that we are facing right now. Sarita? Um, my name is Sarita Lachesis and I'm a sixth grade teacher at a Quaker school in the city. I'm part of the diversity committee there, but the real reason that I'm drawn to this work is that my parents were one of the first um, families to do transracial adoption in Pennsylvania, and they raised their adopted children alongside their biological children. Um, this is actually a picture of my family. I'm in the back, I'm like 12 years old. Um, and it was very obvious to me at a young age that my siblings did not get to benefit from the same positive assumptions that I did. And so as I got older, I wanted to understand why, but more importantly, I wanted to be part of the change so that they could. Okay, so um, before this project started, um, I kind of took it upon myself to interview about 15 um, white people who are in my lives, either as friends, family, um, associates, uh, colleagues, just to kind of get a better idea of how they feel about what's going on and some of the terminology that is being used when talking about racial injustice and inequality. And one, th one of the ones that kept on popping up was white privilege. Uh, this statement, this phrase, elicits a lot of strong feelings and emotions from people, which is completely understandable. So I felt it was important that we tackle this right off the bat and kind of dispel some of the myths and misunderstandings of what this exactly means. 
And um, just want to say, like, no one is saying that, you know, you as a white American didn't earn your home. You did earn your home. You worked hard to get the education that you have um, to build the life that you built for yourself, to build the business if you are a business owner, and to get where you got took a lot of work. Um, life is hard enough as it is uh, with a, pl a fair playing field. Uh, but what we're talking about more is about uplifting those who are not afforded the same fairness, um, who are throw thrown other obstacles that they have to circumnavigate just to get where uh, other white Americans have got, uh, white America has gotten. And again, when we talk about white privilege, we're trying, we talk more about uplifting other Americans to have the same qualities and opportunities in life not handing anyone anything, not taking away anything from anyone. You know, everyone has the God-given right to pursue happiness, and that is what we're trying to do, taking away the obstacles that are put in pe some people's ways because of the color of their skin, their sexual orientation, their race, their religion. Those should not be um, reasons why people are denied opportunities and fairness. And kind of going off of that, another term that comes up a lot is this idea of white guilt. And white guilt is the guilt that some white people feel for the harm caused by racist treatment of people of color, both historically and currently. Um, we're here to say that we don't see that as a positive response to racism. In the first place, it's not energizing. If anything, it's paralyzing. We need energy for this work. Uh, also, it's rooted in the past and not in the future, and we want to be focused on the future. So we're hoping that this presentation can also let people let go of white guilt if that's something that they're struggling with. Yeah, and just to piggyback off of that also, as um, Sarita says, you know, guilt, from guilt comes anger and shame, and we don't want that from um, our white allies. We don't want people to feel shame of being white. You should never be ashamed of who you are and who you were born. Um, we want you to be standing shoulder to shoulder with us um, in this campaign, proud of who you are and proud of the fight that we are taking on because ultimately all of this comes from a place of love and patriotism for your country and your fellow citizens. Uh, so we chose the term intervention um, for many obvious reasons because intervention is something you do for someone that you love. Um, and I think we can all agree everyone here loves our country and we know that this conversation is going to be uncomfortable. It's going to stir up some emotions and probably some anger and you know some hurt feelings perhaps. And as Sarita mentioned before, we are asking that you guys take a step back, open our hearts, open minds, and just kind of listen to what we're saying and you know take what we're saying back home with you and think about what we're saying. and. Hopefully, the intervention for America will lead to recovery, um, a better future, and a better world for everyone, regardless of race, ethnicity, and um, national origin. And so when we were thinking about this workshop, we had some specific goals that are takeaways that we wanted people to have. First of all, we wanted people to understand what white privilege is, as well as its historical context. Also, uh, the ability to identify white privilege in their own life on a small and large scale, because when you can identify in your own life, you can find more opportunities to make change. And then, of course, why is it important to, to see your privilege? And then how can you use this privilege to bring about change? Because that is the goal. Okay, so cognitive dissonance um, is a psychological term. Um, I have a master's degree in um, forensic psychology. so. You know, this is something I lean heavily on in terms of understanding the world around me and people. Um, basically, to boil it down, it's basically when you have two contradicting ideas, thoughts, or opinions, or realities that don't make sense. And in our minds, they just don't seem to be able to co coexist in the same universe. Um, the examples I like to bring up is the ideas, the idealized image of America. We've all grown up, uh, myself growing up in Liberia before I even came to the U.S., uh, the United States is the good guy, and it still is the good guy. And but you know, the ideals like streets paved with gold, everyone happy, and that shining city on the hill concept is hard to reconcile with the idea that there's still racial injustices and inequalities and the discrimination within the United States. How can the good guy have bad qualities? And that naturally causes a, 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 a person to kind of rebel and kind of push away and resist hearing the realities of that. 
Uh, we are taking a concept that's usually focused on an individual and applying it to an uh, entire nation. But, you know, a nation is made up of individuals and the reactions seem to be similar across the board. The other um, one is how can you acknowledge the shame of uh, America's racist history and still be proud to be American? You can still be proud of America. You can still be proud of your family members even and still acknowledge their faults and their shortcomings. Um, racism is not unique to the United States. Uh, an example I like to use is Germany. Germany turned around and it faced its ugly history of the Holocaust and World War II head on. But if you meet a German, they're still proud to be German, but they're also ashamed of their part of their history, but they're also proud of how they tackled that and made a better Germany in a way, in a way where at least they feel it will never happen again. And that's the challenge I'm putting forth to you is you can acknowledge your shameful history, still be a proud American, and also be proud of the work that you can put in to better your country. Because again, as I, this is gonna be a re reoccurring theme for me, it's coming out of a place of love and patriotism for your country and your fellow Americans. Um, so racial terminology can be daunting. I know that I find it daunting. And so just for clarity's sake for this workshop, we're gonna use the term people of color and when we say people of color, that's used to describe anybody who's not considered white in the United States as well as Canada. Um, and this is becoming more common in social justice circles because it emphasizes the common experience of systemic racism for people who are not white. Uh, it used to be that the term minorities was used to describe people of color, but that didn't feel great when the people you were talking about were not the numerical minority in their communities anymore. And so that's, that's kind of where people of color came from. You also might hear communities of color sometimes. Um, that all being said, even though we are going to use this term, not everybody feels completely comfortable with it. Some people, there's a lot of pushback because it is only breaking people into two types of categories. And so not everybody appreciates it. So while we're gonna use it, I would not blindly use it. And, you're in a conversation with someone, maybe agree upon the terminology that you want to use. Just in general, that's a good idea when you're having these difficult conversations, just to try to make sure that any miscommunications like that are handled at the start. Um, okay, so we are going to talk about uh, four different types of racism. And the first type of racism that we're going to discuss is institutional racism. Institutional racism is overarching. It's also deeply ingrained in our society. And because of that, it might be the hardest to see and the hardest to accept. Because accepting it means it's, it's a lot of work to deal with and a lot of work to combat. And so when we, stay, when we say institutional racism, we're referring to all the policies and laws and regulations that try to maintain the status quo. And the status quo means there's a social and economic advantage of whites over non-whites. And so you're going to see that in discrimination in housing, education, political power, healthcare. the list goes on and on. Um, we're going to watch a video in a minute about housing and education, and then I'm going to talk a little bit more about the political power piece. But I also just want to say and emphasize that even if some of these rules and policies are no longer in place, they are still important because nothing was ever done to remedy the damage that they caused. So an example of that would be the legacy of Jim Crow laws. Those were laws on the local and state level that forced segregation in the South. And even if they're not legal anymore, nothing was done to, to cut, try to combat what had happened. And so you're still seeing a lot of the same reoccurring issues how many years later. Is that 90% of elected officials are white, 65% are white men, but white men only represent 31% of the population. So just putting those numbers out there. But because of institutional racism, you have, it directly leads to something called environmental racism. And environmental racism, they were talking about that at the end of the video, is the disproportionate impact environment, environmental hazards have on people of color. And what happened with the water crisis in Flint, Michigan in 2014, put environmental racism on a lot of people's radar, including mine. And what happened there was that they changed the water sources. It ended up that people had lead in the water. And then in that community, 56.6% of the population identified African American. And that's because of institutional racism and segregation 
that that video talked about. And with all of that in mind, uh, when people were trying to do uh, authorities' attention, the response was extremely slow. And so that being said, environmental racism is nothing new. And 56% of the population near toxic waste sites are people of color. And people of color have 38% higher nitrogen dioxide exposure, and they're two times more likely to live without potable water and modern, sanit modern sanitation. And I think the most shocking number for me is that 95% of people of color's claims against polluters are denied by the EPA. And so this was our first pause for questions. I don't, if there's a question that you wanted to bring to us. Yes, if this is opportunity for you to write your questions on the chat box or on the question and answer section. Right now, I don't see no questions as of now. So we will be waiting for anyone that will ask a question. In the meantime, I think that you can continue. Awesome. Okay, so the um, next form of racism is cultural racism. And this is based on the societal belief that traits and individuals from a particular racial um, or ethnic group is the standard and superior to all others. Um, one of the examples that I like to give is um, when you go to work, especially in corporate America, what is considered professional hair? Um, typically is based off of a European standard of straight hair that can easily pulled back. Um, African-Americans especially, hair does not grow. Uh, quite the same way, and especially for black women who spend hundreds of millions of dollars in hair straightening products just so they can meet this um, ideal of what professional is. Um, another example of what cultural racism is, uh, the Disney princesses. Um, we have um, Princess Jasmine from the 90s and then until recently, um, Princess Tiana. And some of you might be saying, well, what about Pocahontas and Mulan? They were not princesses. Um, and as we all know, I have two little girls and there's nothing that a little girl doesn't want to be more than a princess when growing up. And while, you know, I love the scrolls in movies and my girls love them too, it is important that we remember that representation is very important. Um, we've had cases where, you know, young athletes in high school have had their dreadlocks cut off because they didn't meet code. That code is based off of white hair. Um, that's just another example of um, cultural racism. Another one I'd like to bring to your attention is how many of us grew up chasing the ice, ice cream truck down the road? And that r familiar song that's constantly um, playing over and over and over. Most of us probably don't know where that song comes from or the words to that song. Well, the chorus to the original um, song goes something to this effect, and I'm quoting here, um, and loves a watermelon, ha, 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 ha. And the chorus ends with, there's nothing like a watermelon for a hungry coon. Now imagine being a child growing up, being happy when you hear that song, and then finally realizing what the original lyrics to that song is. It is demoralizing, it is heartbreaking, and it affects a person's um, self-esteem. And that's just another example of how cultural racism affects people. And um, this video that we're going to um, hit on is just another example of how the consistent um, images and movies that we see and even through advertising affects us. Well, uh, representation in TV and music and ads in cartoons affects us at a very early age. And I also like to point out um, from a psychological point of view, it is not just affecting children of, of um, minority groups. It is also affecting European um, children of white um, families as well. Sarita? Yep, I'm going to try again for a video, so may I do this time correct? <laughs> Let's see, admitting play. This is the doll test, and this originated, this was an experiment in the 1940s, um, and it's pretty obvious what they're doing. I'm not going to play the whole video, uh, but I, I believe this presentation is going to be available to people. I suggest you watch the entire video because it's, it's shocking. So it started in the 1940s as an experiment, uh, but this was redone in 2012. So just keeping in, that in mind, about eight years ago, think about these kids, they're now eight years older than they were, um, and let's hope I do this correctly. Which doll is the black doll? Yes. And which one is the white doll? Which doll 
is the pretty doll? Which doll is the nice doll? Which doll is the bad doll? Which doll is the nice doll? And which doll is the bad doll? And, well, and why is that doll pretty? Because she's white and you have two eyes. Which doll is the ugly doll? Why is that doll ugly? Because, he, because he's black. Which doll looks most like you? Yeah, which one looks like you? And that one. Okay. Um, and for me, the, the, the kids' faces are just horrifying. And so when I think about culture, ra cultural racism, I think about the impact it directly has on kids and young minds and how it makes people feel about themselves. And just to kind of put a cap on um, cultural racism, because I feel it's one of the more insidious forms of racism, because it's all around us. Um, the idea of hard work versus natural talent. For those of you who might be sports fans, um, if you've watched enough NFL combine or NBA basketball spe specifically, um, you've probably heard the terms, he's a gym rat, he's a hustler, he works hard, he burns the midnight candle. Um, and that's almost always, I could close my eyes and you can almost always guess that the athlete they're talking about is white. Again, that, in, that paints a picture of someone who's hardworking, who's intelligent. Tom Brady's always described as super smart, works hard, he's a gym rat. Um, as opposed to when they're talking about black athletes, typically the terminology they're using is he's just naturally gifted, he jumps out of the gym, God-given talent. Um, as you see on the slide, words paint a subconscious pictures, picture for us. Um, it shows us how we see our, it, it affects how we see ourselves in the world, how we see and value other people in the world as well as valuing ourselves. As you saw in the video um, in the last slide, those children's view of how they see themselves and how they value themselves versus other people is heartbreaking. Um, another one is mental illness versus intent. Um, usually when the shooter is a white, uh, typically a white male, the first thing you hear is about his mental history, as opposed to if the criminal is a person of um, African-American origin or Hispanic, automatically you hear about their criminal past. Now you're asking, well, what does one have to do with the other? If someone is suffering from a mental illness, it elicits a little bit more sympathy for that individual. You don't excuse what they did, you don't condone what they did, but you have a bit more sympathy. This is a poor person, a poor person suffering from mental illness and needs help. As opposed to if you're hearing about a person's criminal record, it is indicating a certain level of intent in their action. How can you feel sorry or sympathy for someone that you feel is this is something they've done? This is repetitive action that they per consciously are trying to commit. And this is a very important um, thing I like to point out is um, Black Panther is the first blockbuster movie ever made out, um, within the last 20 years that centered around a black hero. And if I'm not mistaken, it was one of the first movies in a long time that had a predominantly black cast. Now, some of you might be saying it was a brain, it was no, no, um, it was an obvious choice to make this movie. Well, it's well known that Disney um, had reservations because they did not feel that white America would go see a movie that was predominantly African American. And I, my challenge to you, white America, is why did those predominantly white men think that you would not go see that movie? which most of the people I've come across, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, love. That's an example where cultural racism is affecting people at the top and it's permeating down to everyone. And this brings us to individual racism because in, the, in my opinion, individual racism is the grease, if you will, that kind of greases all the cogs of environmental racism, the institutional racism and the cultural racism. And this is the one that most of us are familiar with. Um, the idea that one group is better than the other, or smarter than the other, and as a result, it affects how one group treats another group. Now, um, I wanna say that if some of these things 
are things that you feel like you are guilty of. We don't want you to feel that we're calling you a card member, card carrying member of the KKK or you're burning crosses on your weekends. That is not what we're saying. Um, all of us in some way, shape or form carry some sort of um, bias subconsciously that we're not necessarily aware of. And part of this workshop is to get us, you in particular, to kind of challenge yourself and ask the questions, well, why do I go see this? Why, why is this being said? What is going on? Ask yourself the question. And it is supposed to stir up some kind of feelings and emotions in you. And again, just to ask, step back and kind of think about what's going on. Because individual racism, if that can be tackled and somewhat um, addressed, it affects everything else. Because the individuals are the ones who get elected into office. The individuals are the ones who hire people. The individuals are the ones who are policing our community. The individuals are the ones who are on TV. We are the individuals. So it starts from looking within. Um, a term that's often thrown around now that's directly related to individual racism is the, is the term microaggressions. And these are small daily comments, often they're meant innocently enough, uh, that makes somebody feel not welcome. And so here are just two quick examples. The first is if you were to go to a person who presents as Asian and say, hey, do you speak English? And without ever thinking, the implication there is that that person wasn't born here or something like that, and you have no idea. But that kind of stuff does happen, and that person uh, is going to have an emotional response to that and not feel welcome. Another great example is that uh, if there was a woman of color who's a doctor, oftentimes she'll experience people saying, nurse, can you find the doctor for me? Can I talk to a doctor? But if it were, were a white man in those clothes, that would not be the assumption. So those are just some examples of microaggressions, which are forms of individual racism. So um, I have a little anecdote, but I do want to um, just kind of touch on something. Um, while everyone is capable of being racist um, in America and in Europe, um, the institutions are designed and built to give white America the power and the protection. So in terms of who can be racist, Anyone can be racist. Just like women can be sexist and men can be sexist. Anyone can be racist. However, in the society that we live in, the system empowers the racists who are white to stay in power and to exploit the system and exploit those people of color. Um, so the story I have um, in my job, you know, we are a tourist attraction and we sell a lot of tickets. So we need a lot of change, single dollar bills mostly. And I have three staff members at this time, we're all white, who typically handled going to get the uh, change um, bank down the street. And they usually go get, get it. One day I was bored, I needed something to do and they were really busy. So I decided to take it upon myself. Went in the bank, uh, walked up, asked for $500 in single um, ones. Uh, the bank teller, a young white lady, uh, asks me what company I'm with. I tell her and she asked me for the account number. The entire process took about 15 minutes. Um, I didn't think much about it and I left. I went back to work um, and my staff members were asking me what took so long. And I'm like, well, I didn't know the account number. I had to call you guys. And they looked at me like I was crazy. Like we've never been asked for the account number at most, maybe to ask what company we're with. Um, so I thought this was interesting because um, usually it takes them about five minutes. And then the next week I go back it was a black um, blank bank teller, and I walk up, account number in hand, and she waves it off like, I don't need your account number, just need to know what company you're with. Five minute process. So when we talk about white privilege, um, again, we're not asking to take anything away from you. Simply the fact that someone like me does not want to have to jump through extra hoops that you as a white American doesn't have to. My staff members are kids who are about 25 years old who wear t-shirts and hoodies when they go to the bank. I in my late 30s, won't tell you my age, um, <laughs> collared shirt, button up shirt, um, button down shirt, had had to jump through extra hoops. Um, I like to think it wasn't because of uh, racism or some sort of bias, but it made me think. Two people working in the same bank, two completely different treatments. And it's, uh, it's something that we're asking you guys to pay attention to in your day to day life. There are a few questions um, 
There's two questions that people have asked. Can we go ahead on that on those two? Sure. Let's do that. So the first question is, and this is from Ken. What is your take or comment on the dramatic change in advertising presentations going on now? Some of your examples are very isolated, but endemic to an overall blind community. Marketing is changing presentations. A shame, that's where it changes first and most dramatically. Sarita, did you take that? I didn't, I'm sorry, you blanked out on the last part of that question, but. So it is, what is your take comment on the dramatic change in advertising presentations going on now? Mm -hmm. Since marketing is changing their presentation or their advertisements, mm -hmm. and it is where it starts usually. The changing in marketing. Um, so that's directly addressing cultural racism in a big way, and that's important. Uh, I would say that it's a positive thing, any change is positive, but that's not enough. That while we can start, um, we could start there, we really want to see changes to combat the institutional racism, to give people more opportunities. We might have, there might be, there's still so much inequality regarding education and things like that, and that's where change would really have to happen to give kids and people the same opportunities. So that would be my first response. Ilya, did you have something to Yes, add? so um, I would agree that, you know, our examples, we don't have a lot of time, but if I had all day, I could read examples as examples you know, you know i'll be reading on blue space um however i will say that there are two things that are in play one you know communities of color are getting more and more established um their buying is increasing so as we know in uh, corporate america there's nothing more important than the almighty dollar the other thing that goes along with that is there are we have been Again, not to say that we're still in the 1960s or 80s. We have made a lot of progress. The challenge in so well, you would probably see a correlation between the diverse, diverse hirings in advertising companies that will correlate with the changing in, in the um, type of advertising you are seeing. It has definitely been a concerted effort. In the last three years, I can't count how many interracial couples I have seen where before you would almost be you know, almost a and then possibility to find one commercial. So I hope that answers the question. Um, yeah, that's my take on that. And the other question was, can people of color be racist? So I, I saw that question pop up and I, I think I addressed it. Uh, if Serena would like to add to it. Um, there are different responses to that. And I know that Ilya and I, we've we've had this conversation before and I'm not sure that we fully agree. Uh, there, are, there are thoughts that because people of color do, are not in as many positions of power or that there's still such an inequity that racism is more based on power when we're talking about individual um, institutional racism. That being said, I guess my personal opinion is that, yes, people can judge people based on the color of their skin and um, not give somebody a fair shot. But I don't know if it is always appropriate to call that racism because racism often deals with power. And the last for now is, can this also go for people who are gay? In terms, can gay people be racist? They don't, there's no elaboration on this. Okay. Well, I, I get, all right, I'll, I'll try and tackle it uh, as delicate as I can. Um, I actually, I have to say, in my early 20s, I didn't think gay people could be racist because I felt that they were in a position where they knew what it felt to be marginalized and be judged and treated unfairly. Um, as I've gotten older, I've gained more experience. Um, I've come to find that Yes, gay people can be racist. Um, just like religious people can be hateful, right? Because we associate um, a religious person with being morally upright and um, loving, but we've seen that a religious person can be a hateful person. A gay person can be a, a racist. Um, in Philadelphia, not too long ago, there was a, a case of um, a business owner in uh, the gay neighborhood that 
was caught on video on recording saying some horrendous racist comments about his black patrons and customers. So I think that answers the question. And perhaps the question is, is can this type of um, prejudice be, is that applicable to someone who is gay? That's how I interpreted that question. And so I think that uh, it's going, yes, people who are gay deal with a lot of different prejudice and they have a lot of things to overcome, but I don't think it follows exactly the same story because it's a different history. So I, if that is where that question was, that's what my answer would be. Um, Ilya, did you want to tackle this slide? Uh, yes. Okay. I was just waiting to see if there are any more questions. Um, okay. So this slide is just kind of a synopsis of the different types of racism and how they interplay with one another. Um, as we mentioned before, it kind of starts with the in institutionalized racism, which forces in the past, because I also want to stress that even though rules and laws and policies and politicians who enacted these rules weren't elected necessarily when we were able to vote for them, um, their legacy and their aftermath still um, is, are still with us today. So the policies that forced um, families of color into poverty or kept them in the poverty and made it harder for them to get out of poverty, forced them in a situation where their property values down. Uh, schools are predominantly funded by property taxes. So in an environment where children are growing up poor, their schools are underfunded because their, their families were systematically forced into environments and neighborhoods of low value. Um, and that also goes into the culture as we touched on the cultural racism. And it, when we say institutional racism, racism is not just focusing on the government, it's also corporate America is also part of the whole mechanism. And then ultimately the individual, the individual is the one that greases all of this and permits all this to happen. We are the ones that empower companies, um, politicians, governments, um, police departments, um, retail um, company um, stores, to continue their practices. If we don't hold them to account, they're gonna continue. If we keep patronizing their businesses, they're gonna con continue because ultimately, if they're not getting hurt in the pocketbook, we can protest all we want. It's not gonna make a change. Wow, it's amazing. Um, as a teacher, I love this graphic. Uh, a lot of times people will say something like, well, racism, it, uh, slavery, it was so long ago. Segregation, it was so long ago. But this just gives us a visual that while it may have happened generations ago, when we're looking at the history of the United States, this is how it breaks down. The red represents American slavery, the yellow segregation, and only in the green, the small section, are we starting, are we post-segregation? And so it just helps maybe us to understand and visualize what we're, what we're really dealing with and the history that we're trying to deal with. Um, and another thing that I've heard a lot is how, can, how come we're protesting now? There's a pandemic. Why, why are people taking to the streets? It's not safe, things like that. And I, I would argue that COVID-19 has been part of why people want to protest because it's really shining light that on how, how things are not equal for people. And it, this is a uh, chart from June 13th, 2020 from the CDC, CDC. And you can see that COVID-19 is disproportionately impacting people of color. This is the rate per 100,000. For non-Hispanic American Indian or Alaskan Natives, it's 221.2. This is the hospitalization rate per 100,000. And then for non-Hispanic Black, it's 178.1 per 100,000. But then if you go over, you see for non-Hispanic White, it's 40.1 per 100,000. And of course, it's terrible. It's, it's negatively impacting everybody, but it's hitting communities of color the hardest. And so sometimes presentations like this and just thinking about conversations like this, it's hard to find a positive white identity. I know that I've really struggled with this, especially growing up um, in, in my family and just being confronted with it again and again. And so I found this model by Janet Helms to be helpful. I'm gonna summarize it as quickly as I can, and you can not really think about the, the big words associated with it, but just if any of it rings true for you and your experience. And so the first is, this is the stages of white identity. The first is contact, and that's someone's first contact with this idea of racism. 
I re remember it clearly for me. I was 12, I was in seventh grade, and someone came up to me and said, it's really weird that you live with a bunch of, and then he said the N-word. And I was shocked. And I, it, didn't, it didn't fit with my idea of the world. And so that's where disintegration comes. You're, you have to confront the reality of that, the just, that your idea of a just world isn't, isn't right. The truth is my, my siblings who are black already knew that, but it was my first experience. And then after that, there's a stage of reintegration. It's just too much. You can't, you can't let go of everything that you held on to uh, because the truth about racism is too hard. And that's where cognitive dissonance that Ilya was talking about at the start kind of comes into play. After that, there's the pseudo-independent state, and you start to understand the realities of racism, but you still have many misconceptions. Then there's immersion, and this is the idea of learning as much as it, you can about what it means to be white and how, how that can be a positive thing, too, and how to form a positive white identity. And then finally, living and working in a beloved community, and that's the end goal. And in order for a beloved community to exist, um, People have to be fully comfortable with themselves, and that includes white people and embracing who they are and their history as well. And so I found personally this, this model to be helpful and just to reflect on, do any of these stages fit without judgment? Do any of these experiences mean or align with anything that you have experienced? And also, and I know we're running short on time, so I will just very quickly, these are some queries that you could ask yourself when looking at personal white privilege for yourself. And think about what are some advantages you might have in your housing situation, your schooling, your healthcare experience that others do not, and how does your family's history like, play a role with this? And then where do you see people who look like you in the media? And that's just, not just now, but also in your childhood. And then how is your life experience represented on media? And then finally, just in general, when you're going around your daily life, how do you benefit from, from, benefit from positive assumptions when other people might not? Okay, so um, just to kind of give, I guess, people an idea of how maybe you're asking, can I get into the fray and start making a difference? Um, first off, you know, it's, it's, it's not enough to not be racist. I understand my life hard and hectic for everyone. And we kind of have our head down trying to make ends meet. Hard to lift our heads up and kind of see what's around us. And I, ch I would challenge you to kind of step out of your comfort zone and bubble and try to be more proactive, be anti -proactive. And what does that necessarily mean? It means, you know, calling out people who, you cl who are clearly crossing the line, who are clearly doing something wrong. Um, one thing I like to tell you know, my white friends and coworkers is as much as people of color protest and get angry and, you know, sign petitions and go and vote, ultimately we need white America to stand up with us and make a difference. A lot of, a lot of parts in this country and in the world, your voice carries more weight than someone else. That's uh, the truth, um, but it's the power that you have. I'm a big Batman fan, so that is your super so to speak. Uh, having to be able to put in punch the walls. Um, but it's a reality. Um, another one I would say is challenge yourself and ask yourself, what kind of toys do you have your children playing with? Um, I'm not saying you need to go buy yourself an entire African village for your kids, but do your toys for your children have diversity within them? Children grow up valuing and cherishing the toys they grow up with. Boys typically play with cars. And a boy, when he grows up to become a man, will take care of his car. And that's just a, a fact of how things typically work. Um, another thing I would say is you don't need to go out and start you know, running for office necessarily. Start from the platform that you have. Um, if you're a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher, um, a mechanic, you know, that's your comfort zone. That's what you know. And start from there in um, trying to enact change. Um, when someone says something racist to you or does something racist in front of you, that is also a reflection that they're comfortable being like that in front of you. And it's a reflection of what they think you are like and what you think. So for nothing else, um, if you are not like that, it's disrespectful for someone to be comfortable enough in front of you to act in a racist manner or say racist things. And one thing I also like to say is because I am a parent, um, the world is changing. The demographics of America are changing. 
And for most of America's history, you know, people who are not white have been forced to learn how to integrate into white America. Um, but the demographics are changing. And if for nothing else, you would do your child a big disservice if you do not expose them to diversity, to um, taking them to different movies that have people who don't look like them, taking them to cultural events, um, the Ndunde Festival in Philadelphia, Caribbean Festival in Penn's Landing. There's so many different diverse um, cultural festivals in Philadelphia, in the Philadelphia region. You would be doing your child a disservice if you don't expose them to diversity because they're going to grow up as adults and not know how to interact, how to deal, how to talk to, and how to understand people around them who don't look like them. Um. It can be really daunting to try to interrupt a racist joke or to try to make sure that people aren't saying things that are racist. And so I personally like to have some line that I'm ready to say. And one thing that I just, I like to say is, please don't say things like that. They're prejudiced, they play into negative stereotypes and they're destructive for our community. And I remember the first time I said it, it was, it was forced, it was awkward. Uh, the moments afterwards were really awkward. But, but it was clear where I stood and I didn't have another situation where that person was about to make a joke that was going to be something that I disagreed with again. So it, it does work, but it can be quite difficult. Um, I know we only have three more minutes, so I don't know, Ilya, what do you think about moving to questions? There are additional resources at the end of this slideshow that uh, we will make sure you have access to. Um, yeah, we can. Uh, I think I, know, I think the last video is very um, important, and I think they would be concerned to watch it. We also have one question left in the chat box. Okay, I guess we can answer the question after the video. Okay, or either way works. Just to make sure I can do this. this. Yep, it's not going to load for me right now. I can keep working on it. Can we hear the question for now? And what was the question? Yeah, I'm sorry, we can't hear you. Yeah, you have to unmute yourself. Yep. Yeah. I've heard the term white pearl clutching. What does that mean? Oh, let Sarita take this one. White pearl clutching? I can take it. Is that what it says? White pearl clutching. What is that term? This is, a, this is a space where people are always learning. I have not heard that. Um, I can take a guess. I'm not sure how cool that would be, but now I'm grateful because now I'm inspired to go look that up. But if I, if I think about this idea of a white pearl and like clutching, it's like holding on to privilege. And just not wanting to let go, like holding on to what you perceive as value be white privilege and and not wanting to let it go although letting it go would mean that we're uplifting so many people and we're a better society overall because so many with more people who have more opportunities the better our country is because everybody has a better chance of meeting their potential that's my best answer <laughs> that's the first i've heard of that one okay. yeah are there any other questions? Because I think we have, what, one minute left? <laughs> I see. Okay, so um, I, if I could just also add, um, no you know, it's important that we don't allow the extremists on both sides to drown, drown out the reasonable people in the middle. Um, and this is not a political statement or anything, but on the right and on the left, there are extremist people who you know, they tend to scream the loudest. And those of us in the middle who are actually trying to be reasonable and make substance change tend to get drowned out and we tend to get distracted by those extreme um, people on the edges and the fringes who sometimes tend to drive the bus. So there's nothing else I would also ask that try not to let those ones color or persuade you from not being more proactive in combating this issue that is uh, facing our country. Awesome. Yeah, um, let me make sure I'm not muted. I wanna take this opportunity to say uh, thank you to everyone that signed in to be a part of this webinar. Um, we had so many 
uh, people sign up for this one and for our first one. And we want to say thank you for that support. Um, we think we're a better community when we can dialogue about these issues, when we can come together and have uh, great conversations about issues that aren't always easy to talk about. And it takes courage and it takes uh, integrity to, to come together and say, let's dialogue about these things. And so I'm super proud of the people that have supported us. It's been so many people that reached out to us and said, I want to be a part of this. I want to have this conversation. And so I want to say on behalf of the YWCA, we're really grateful. I want to uh, shout out Sarita and Ilya and say thank you guys for putting together this presentation. Um, I learned a lot. I have to look up the white clutching. I, I, I don't know what that is, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to research. I'm going to figure out what that is. Um, Someone but, actually wrote the meaning of the white clutching of the pearls. Okay. It says, from Chrissy, thank you for um, this. It says, clutching my pearls, Urban Dictionary, a moment in time that fo forces one to clasp their hand to their chest out of fear or shock as if trying to protect an imaginary pearl necklace. That's a okay. new phrase. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, we're, so, so that's the goal of all of this, right? To learn and to, <laughs> and to get information. So we did this in real time. Thank you to everyone that supported us. We're going to continue to do this as a YWCA Bucks. Um, and I think we're going to have great conversations. Thank you again to Ilya. Thank you again to Sarita. We'll see you guys again. And uh, everyone have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.